I will kick this off to our fantastic group of Marshall Scholar alumni, our current scholars here with us today. I'm gonna to go around and ask each panelist to introduce themselves, explain why you applied to be a Marshall and what it has meant to you in your life in, as a science professional or in your science academic career. So I think to start, I will go with Aaron. All right. I'll Sorry go about that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I always get put first because my name starts with two A's. Anyway, uh, hi everybody, I'm Aaron. Uh, I'm a 2020 scholar uh, here at the University of Cambridge. We're having lovely weather today. Um, so yeah, I, why did I apply to the Marshall Scholarship? So in undergrad, I went to the University of Florida, go Gators, um, and I studied uh, regeneration biology. That was kind of my, I was really interested in cutting things and watching them regrow. I thought it was really cool. Um, and my plan is to, my career goal at least, is to um, after going to medical school, become a physician and uh, develop uh, regenerative therapies um, for patients. Uh, and that was kind of, kind of pushed me towards applying for the Marshall Scholarship because I had this really specific goal in mind. Um, and I had a lot of various interests in things outside of uh, medicine directly. Um, and I knew that once I started in medical school, I wouldn't really have the time to explore my different interests. So I thought the Marshall Scholarship would be a great way to take some time off before starting med school, explore these really cool interests of mine um, in a different country, no less, and then go back to medical school with all the gained knowledge. And hopefully that would help me accomplish my goals. Um, and I'm doing my first year here at the University of Cambridge, uh, doing a research degree uh, on stem cell biology. And I'll be doing my second degree at King's College London uh, in a degree based on commercialization of regenerative therapies. Um, and what the Marshall's meant to me so far. Well, I will say our, our, our Experience has been impacted uh, for the current scholars here in the UK. It has been impacted a lot by the pandemic, which is unfortunate, but we're all making the most of it. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely trying to make the most of it. Um, I, I've gotten to meet all kinds of people from all over the world. Um, it really is an international community, at least here in Cambridge. Um, especially there's a lot of Europeans here in the UK as well. Well, there are for now. I don't know how Brexit's going to impact that, but um, there are a lot of people to meet. Um, and I grew up in Florida. I was born and raised in Florida. I went to university in Florida. Um, so most of the people I knew and talked to were Floridians. So having this uh, dynamic interaction with all these people from all over the world has really opened up my perspectives. And it's been a really uh, life-changing experience so far. Yep. Thank you so much. And I think what would make sense is, Emily, let's go to you because you're also our current Marshall Scholar here. So let's hear how your experience is going. Then we'll go to some of the alumni. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Emily Stefke. I am also a 2020 Marshall. I am currently at the University of Oxford, and I'm actually in a DPhil program. Um, so uh, that's just what Oxford calls PhDs. Um, and I am studying uh, tumor immunology. So um, I'm actually researching um, the development of a vaccine for the treatment of glioblastoma. Um, and that's been really, really great. Um, but um, my path to the Marshall um, started uh, at my undergraduate university. Um, I went to Michigan State University, uh, kind of like Erin, I was uh, born and uh, mostly raised <laughs> in Michigan and um, I also attended my state school and really, really loved it. Um, and I majored in uh, English as well as neuroscience while I was there. And um, like Erin, I'm also interested in going to medical school after I am finished with my Marshall. But one of the great things about British PhDs is that they're shorter than traditional US PhDs. And by the end of my time in undergrad, I knew I did not want to start medical school right away. I was feeling pretty burned out um, from sitting in classes, but I knew I really did want to get into research and um, be doing research full time, but also be able to be working toward a degree. And um, I really kind of developed a strong interest um, through my undergrad in brain cancer immunotherapies. And I had a lot of experience doing uh, neuroscience related research in undergrad, but I didn't have much experience in cancer or definitely in immunology. And so um, being here uh, working with my lab at Oxford, I am learning so much about immunology and cancer. And um, it's um, 
been just a really uh, great experience overall. Um, British PhDs are very strange in some ways compared to a traditional uh, US PhD, and I'm happy to talk more about that later uh, if people are interested. Um, but uh, despite that, <laughs> I, I think that um, I'm really making the most of it. And yeah, unfortunately, we haven't been able to have as many of the big group Marshall events, um, but there are a decent number of Marshalls here in Oxford that I've gotten to meet in person. And um, that's been really wonderful. And um, again, uh, coming to the UK has been really amazing because um, the community is so international. Uh, my lab is made up of uh, students from all over the world and um, Again, I really like that coming from somewhere where I was, you know, mostly raised around people from Michigan. So that's been really, really wonderful. And uh, yeah, I think it's been a great way to really like jumpstart my research career. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Emily. And we'll come back to that question, that point you made about how different it is than the U.S. experience. Um, so I'll pose that to all of you guys later on. But I think let's go over to Hope now. Um, introduce yourself why you, how you got to Marshall, et cetera. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Hope. I'm a 2015 Marshall. I'm originally from outside of St. Louis. Uh, and then I did my undergrad at the University of Chicago. Um, I majored in physics, but I did a minor in human rights. Uh, and I think kind of, it's interesting. I feel like there are similar themes through all of our stories, uh, but I also was pretty burnt out by the end of undergrad and I wanted to do a PhD in physics, but um, really felt like I needed uh, to do something in between. <laughs> and I was also really still interested in human rights and science and, and trying to understand if there was some way to sort of combine these two fields in, in some professional capacity. Um, so I was looking into, you know, the various scholarships, uh, not thinking I would actually get it, but sort of enjoying the process of thinking about what to propose and, and using it as a kind of way to explore, explore my interests. Um, and then I was pretty surprised to get the Marshall and, and actually have the chance um, to study in the UK. Uh, so in my first year, I did a master's in science, science and technology studies at the University of Edinburgh, which is actually, or it's like a social science degree. So it's, it's not technically hard sciences, but it's the study of science. Um, and then from there, I moved to Cambridge, where uh, I had initially proposed to a master's, but sort of already being in the UK, um, I found other funding sources. So I, I started a PhD on the Marshall, and then I just wrapped that up um, at the end of this year. Um, and since then, I've moved to Germany. I've started a postdoc at a Max Planck Institute here. Uh, and I feel like the Marshall, I guess, what it has meant to me is, is kind of like what the others have said. Uh, it really... I think leaving the U.S. and I was I'm also like born and raised in the Midwest and sort of had never really gone outside of that. You get very different perspectives. Um, I think in the sciences, it's interesting to see how science is done in different places, because uh, I think for all of us, or at least in the U.S., it's very common to do research in your undergrad, whether during the year or in the summers, um, and being able to see how labs work and the perspectives that people take uh, somewhere else is really valuable, as well as meeting people from all over the world. Um, and then you also do have this jumping off point for a lot of different places. So I don't think that I would be in Germany if I had not done the Marshall. And um, I guess getting here is a bit of a confluence of the Marshall and personal circumstances and COVID and all this. Uh, but it, it definitely is an opportunity uh, that I, yeah, I think would have never come about had I, had I not actually been in the UK and sort of met the people that I did. Uh, and I also think that um, I'm still kind of trying to figure out ways to combine uh, both science and sort of this interest in social science. Um, but I think one thing that I've been learning about as well is that um, sort of uh, post the PhD level, the funding structures for academia in, in Europe um, often are a lot more interdisciplinary than uh, some of what you might experience in the US. And so there are kind of interesting advantages and ways to kind of pursue research and your interests um, depending on the country you're in. So it, it opens up a lot of opportunities, so. Great, thank you. So I think we'll kick it off to Jim next. If you wanna introduce yourself, tell us about your experience and then Kate, we'll have you close for the introductions and we'll get into some questions. Hi, I'm, I'm Jim Stashoff. Uh, I was Marshall way back. Let's see, I think they officially list me as matriculating, which is the beginning thing they pay attention to in 1958. So things may have changed since then. 
I was already a graduate student at Princeton, but to continue the Michigan theme, I did my undergrad in Ann Arbor and then went to Princeton for a couple of years for personal reasons, wanted a change of venue, applied for the Marshall, got it, went to, oh, by the way, while I had been at Princeton, I had met a couple of British mathematicians, uh, one of whom was at Brasenose College in Oxford. So I chose not only Oxford, but Brasenose in particular. It helps to have a personal connection, but I found the whole mathematics setup in Oxford was so different. Uh, I think I was very fortunate that I could read for a graduate degree rather than the undergraduate degree, which was totally different from both my undergraduate and graduate experience up to that point. I did participate. I rode with my college one year. Um, for my second year, I had married and brought my wife with me to Oxford, and that was a whole other learning experience. Um, I think that about covers it. Uh, mathematics is probably not of interest to all these med students, but uh, there are some connections much more now today than there ever were before. Jim, you never know. There could be someone on here who's very dead set on mathematics and hearing from you could really be the push to get them to apply. So thank you for that. Um, so Kate, let's go over to you. Sure, Kate Weber. Um, I was a 2007 Marshall Scholar. I did a PhD uh, at Cambridge in molecular biology. I worked on C. elegans and genetic um, mechanisms for kind of uh, neuronal patterning and function in C. elegans, which is a little worm for those who aren't familiar. Um, I actually came to the Marshall I, I was at, at, my undergraduate institution was the University of Richmond. It was not a place that at the time had any kind of formal preparation for scholarship uh, applicants. And I didn't know about the Marshall Scholarship. I was applying to US graduate schools. I wanted to do a PhD. I wanted to become a professor. Um, and I had a dean who approached me and encouraged me to apply. I didn't really, like, like some others have said, I didn't think I would get the scholarship, but I did. I had um, and was very excited about the idea of studying in the UK. You know, as everyone else had said, it was definitely a, an eye-opening experience for me. It actually, I think, in part because of the many disciplines um, of the Marshall scholars, and also just the kind of ability to interact with others outside of my field at Cambridge through the college system. Um, I began to explore some of these, the connections between science and society, um, got involved in scientific writing and science policy conferences and things and realized that that was where my real passion lies in, um, in thinking about how science can and should impact policy, how policy impacts how science is practiced in different countries and regions. Um, and so I moved after my PhD to Washington DC and did a couple of science policy fellowships working first for a scientific society and then for the government at the Department of State. And I now work at Google on the public policy team um, I'm working with our research organization. So Google has about 4,000 researchers mostly in the computer science space. Um, and you know, working with them to understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, talk to policymakers about it, think about what kinds of policies we want to recommend um, in different countries around the world. That's my story in a nutshell. But I do think that the the Marshall and also the just the UK educational setting uh, contributed a lot to how to my own discovery of my interests and where my career has gone since. Great, and I think a really good place to start is really touching on what Emily had mentioned. What are, what would you guys say are the big differences with pursuing a graduate degree, PhD, master's, whatever it may be, 
in the UK through the Marshall Scholarship versus doing it in the US? Maybe what led you to, Emily, you touched upon what led you to not do the US route. Um, so I'm just curious if any of you guys have any additional thoughts on that, because I think that's a really easy starting place for people who are considering the Marshall Scholarship. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to start. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that are different. And um, I guess I can start with maybe some of the more logistical things. So most UK PhDs are much shorter than US PhDs on the scale of three to four years rather than five to eight or more um, in the US. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, so you kind of miss out on um, the whole part of the PhD where you take classes, where you teach classes, where you potentially do rotations in different labs and have a lot of time to kind of flounder around and figure what you're interested in. Um, Whereas in the UK, you have much less time. And because you have so much less time, you come in with a specific project in mind that um, for most students has already kind of been prescribed for them and advertised directly um, that you then have three to four years to figure out how to make happen. And um, that's one of the advantages actually to applying to um, some uh, British universities PhD programs through the Marshall versus um, kind of through their traditional routes is that you might get to have more say on what kind of project you want to do. So um, when most people pull up a website for a lab that they might be interested in, that lab might be advertising a few different PhD projects. Um, and there's maybe a paragraph written of like what this idea of this PhD project might be and you apply to that project specifically. Um, and there, there are opportunities to um, work with um, labs you're potentially interested in to propose um, projects as well, but um, it can be more difficult to get funding for that sort of thing as well. So um, for me, coming in with Marshall, uh, because I had my own funding already when I was kind of um, then applying to the program at Oxford and um, talking to the lab I ended up working in, um, I was kind of able to say, um, I already have this funding. We don't have to worry that much about like whether I'm going to get accepted to this program. Instead, we can just come up with this really great project. And um, my lab here specializes in cancer vaccines. They don't know much about the brain at all. So I get to really bring that in and say, yes, I want to see if we can make this vaccine work in the context of the brain. And um, for me, that ended up being like a really good option. Um, so that's something that's a little bit different. Um, but I will also say that um, once you get here, uh, in general, um, again, this is going to vary a lot depending on what lab you're in and, and what your, um, your supervisor is like, but many supervisors are a lot less hands-on than they would be in the U.S. So you have this specific project, but the kind of general thought is that they kind of like throw you in, sink or swim, and, you know, hopefully you come out of it with a PhD. And some supervisors are way more or less hands-on, and that's really going to depend on who you're working with. And that's something you can kind of suss out um, when you're talking to uh, potential uh, PIs that you might be working with as well, if that's something you want more or less of. Um, but what, one thing I will point out, which bears mentioning, is that also the funding is quite different. So um, in the US, PhDs are generally pretty well paid in the sciences. Um, in the UK, uh, the average PhD student probably doesn't make as much money as a typical American PhD student, um, but there's not very much financial incentive to do a PhD on the Marshall because um, the Marshall pays the Marshall stipend, which is um, really, really nice if you're, you know, here doing a master's degree and you're getting money to, to do that, um, which normally you just have to pay for. Um, but like for me on my Marshall stipend, I make about 40% less than what everybody else in my institute makes. And Marshall will not let me get capped up on that money, even though my institute offers that. Um, so that's kind of a weird caveat with Marshall. Um, and that's something we're 
kind of trying to see if we can get them to change uh, because it is really frustrating. Um, but um, it also kind of offers the opportunity, like I mentioned earlier, to um, have a funded PhD and then apply to medical school separately. So if you're somebody interested in doing both an MD and a PhD, but you don't wanna go the traditional MD, PhD, eight year route, like I didn't feel like I was prepared to do this, still is a really um, a good option for me. So any of our other panelists, alumni, current students have anything they think they want to add on? Hope, I see you unmuted. Yeah, I'll add a little bit um, also about master's programs, uh, just because those, uh, a lot of people also just want to do one or two separate master's um, in their Marshall, uh, and those can be a really good option for the sciences. Um, a lot of the masters in the UK can be really specific. So uh, you can look for courses that are, are kind of like very detailed on what you're interested in. Uh, this can be really great if you really want to learn something slightly different than what your background is uh, in your undergrad. Um, and then I would just say when you're looking out for programs, look for the, or like be aware of the distinction between taught and research. So if you're doing some sort of research program, that's more like what you would do in a PhD that it's gonna be a year or something where you'll do work in the lab and then write up a dissertation. Whereas a taught program, you're mostly in classes. Um, there's also an option, especially at Cambridge, it's pretty common for people to do programs that are called like the part three program. And I think a lot of other institutes have those as well, uh, where you do sort of the final year of the undergraduate degree. Um, and it's like the undergrads themselves also come out with a master's at the end of that. So you do sort of the master's level coursework uh, and again, this can be a really good way to kind of um, get a different perspective on maybe what you did in undergrad or, you know, get a little bit more grounding in like math or theory or uh, something like that. Um, and yeah, I think that's a helpful direction for some people to go. Um, I think there was something else I was going to say, but I forgot. So I'll end there. <laughs> If it comes back to you, feel free to just chime in. Um, anything else on this topic anyone wants to contribute? Just very briefly, uh, comparing the systems in mathematics, especially at Princeton versus Oxford, there wasn't a great deal of difference. Uh, coursework was not emphasized. Participation in seminars was. But when it came to submitting my thesis, I asked my supervisor, well, what are the requirements? Because in the US, it would have specified the size of the font, the margins, the uh, thickness of the paper, and all sorts of things like that. So I asked my supervisor, what are the requirements? He said, well, if you're going to submit a sonnet, it should have 14 lines. Typical British humor. Anyone else? Um, I, I guess maybe to just add to Jim's point in terms of, at least for me, and I'm sure this varies as well, depending on the program, but kind of the, the process of defending my dissertation was a little bit, like I had a defense, but it wasn't like I worked with a committee throughout my PhD and got feedback from them on how I was doing. It was basically just like talking to my supervisor about how he thought I was doing. And then at the end, they sort of select a few people. In my case, I think it was just three people. Um, and, and I had like a, a fairly, you know, a lot like I think a, a US defense in the sense that I, you know, we were there for several hours. They asked me lots of questions, but it, there were not as many opportunities for feedback along the way. Um, I guess the only other thing I would just mention is that to the point um, that Hope made about taught versus research degrees, um, I think it's maybe worth noting that I think research uh, marshals have a pretty different experience than a lot of other marshals who are not, like there's not a lot of time in class for taught degrees, particularly, I don't, you know, I didn't actually know that many people in, in STEM taught degrees, but particularly like in the humanities, a lot of my Marshall classmates had a lot of free time or just trying to figure out how to fill their free time. I, on the other hand, was spending very long days in the lab. So it was like, I, I, and I ended up, I think in part because of that, you know, connecting more with other social groups 
um, than a lot of my martial classmates did who, who really like they would hang out a lot with each other. Um, I still found though that there were a lot of those opportunities to make friends. And I mentioned this at the beginning outside of my discipline that I don't think I would have had in a US program, both at Cambridge because I was in a college in addition to my, my institute. You know, I met a lot of friends in other disciplines who were in the same college as me. Um, and I think there's also just my experience in the UK is that there was um, more, more opportunity and encouragement for PhD students to pursue interests outside of the lab, um, whether that's various, like I mentioned science policy and science writing, but I also played water polo. I swam on the university swim team. Like I met a lot of people that way and I don't think I would have had those opportunities in a US PhD program. I think that's a really good point to end on, especially about the differences in the type of academic field you're in, um, which I think goes to show the importance of how um, our friends in San Francisco set up these sessions so people could really get a sense of what they will be expecting in the specific field versus if they join, say, the humanities one, they might hear different things that won't always relate. Um, and I guess I do have one question that I'll pose to all of you. If you want to chime in, feel free. If not, it's totally fine. But What's one thing you expected going into the Marshall program that ended up being true, being true? And then is there anything that you didn't expect being a Marshall that ended up happening or being true? I certainly I'll give you guys some time to say, great, Jane. I great. certainly didn't expect to be treated by the faculty at Oxford almost as a colleague rather than as a student. Again, participation in seminars is the norm and the normal activity of a mathematician and nothing comparable to being in a lab. Um, something I didn't expect was how much the Marshall Network would impact me. Um, it, like before I want it, there's uh, you, now, nowadays, whenever I'm reading through things, I'm always seeing like, oh, this person was a marshal. Oh, this person was a marshal. And on top of that, I feel like the marshal network is really strong and really important. Like it's helped me land like a summer job in, um, venture capital where I had like no experience in venture capital whatsoever. Um, and then I, I, I ended up getting another job in venture capital here in Cambridge. And it just turned out that the CEO was a marshal scholar a couple of years ago. So it's just those kinds of connections and the network that it opens up. That's something that I didn't really expect when I won it. Um, but it's a really nice uh, added benefit of having won the scholarship. Hi, um, if anyone comes up with anything, feel free to chime in. And um, one thing I think everyone on the line wants to know what there are a bunch of different qualities that make a marshal a marshal. All of you guys have different backgrounds, different interests, and that's clear just from talking to you here today. But I think people would like to hear what you think is a quality for, for Marshall that should push them to apply and get through the door. I mean, I guess I can start here. I don't, I'm hesitant. I guess one thing that I would say is if you're thinking about applying, you should apply and just, I think, you know, Hope mentioned that the exercise of thinking about how to approach the application, for me, like thinking about how to like tell my story and what, what do I really want to with this going forward, that in itself was really valuable. I think that if you, if you do that and really sort of like are honest about your motivations, what excites you, why you, why you want the marshal and it's a great opportunity for self-reflection and you know you'll be whether or not you get the scholarship it, it's a useful exercise i I'm, I'm hesitant to like you know obviously marshals are all very motivated i mean like outgoing interest like not necessarily outgoing but they're all really interesting people they bring different perspectives have a lot of different qualities i think it's one of these things where um it's so competitive that some of it, of course, is luck in the end, like who gets selected <laughs> is going to be luck, but that shouldn't, the competitive aspect shouldn't stop you from the exercise of applying because that in itself is valuable. Um, I don't know if I totally answered your question. <laughs> Sorry about that, but. 
But one question that came up in uh, when I was being interviewed for the Marshall was what my attitude was toward British culture. So certainly being open to experience in a, yes, they speak English, but it's a foreign country. And just because we speak the language, use the same words, doesn't always mean the same thing. And you can occasionally uh, stick your foot in the mouth by misunderstanding their vocabulary. So just be as open, emphasize your openness and uh, best of luck. Um, if anyone has any other thoughts, again, feel free to chime in. We did get a question from the audience, which I think is a really important one. How did you choose which college and university to attend? What led you to choose the school you're at and the program you're, you went into or are currently in? I can jump in. So um, to answer the first question, and then I'll come to the, the question in the chat too. Um, I, I would totally agree that um, Marshall Scholars are all in all just really interesting people. Um, and one of my favorite things about everyone that I've met is everyone feels um, very genuine and just like very genuinely passionate about the things that they're doing and um, have kind of an energy about them that can make you really excited about what they're doing. Um, even if it's something like you never thought you'd be excited about. Well, one of my friends um, here, his name is Mike, he studies transportation engineering. And I was like, I, I don't even ever think that I, I thought that much about like what that is. And now I feel so passionate about them. I'm like, man, the way that streets in my town are structured, like literally changes the way you interact with like your town and like changes your life so much. So just like hearing other people talk about the things that they do and the things that they're interested, be it like academic or not, um, has just been really great. And um, I, I think that like the diverse community of Marshalls um, has, is just like such a blessing on my life. And I'm so grateful that I get to be a part of that. Um, but to answer the question just about um, the uh, university, um, for me, it was looking at universities that had um, labs that I was interested in and um, not just maybe one lab, but um, kind of a group of labs potentially that um, all uh, study or specialize in certain things. Um, and so like I knew that coming there, I would have a range of experts who um, would be able to uh, kind of recruit people for seminars and um, give advice and things like that. Um, so that's something that like led me to Oxford. I think I was also uh, very honestly just attracted to Oxford because I didn't like go to a fancy prestigious undergraduate university and I was like Oxford sounds really cool there's all these fancy old buildings like maybe it'll be really great um I found that Oxford is an incredibly strange university in a lot of ways <laughs> compared to what I'm used to in an American university and some of it I'm like yeah I could take it or leave it but um it's been really cool to kind of see what that kind of academic uh life is like and just to see all of the tradition here as well. I had met my first supervisor uh, while I was in Princeton, my first Oxford supervisor while I was in Princeton. He was a visiting professor for a while. I had already established a relationship so part of my application was pointing that out that I intended to continue to work with him. So if by any chance you have any connection to a specific lab head, I guess for you lab people, or anybody else that you would like to work with for your DPhil in Oxford, by all means, uh, maintain that contact, develop it, and include it in your application. Just gonna add a couple things in terms of um, finding a, a program that you wanna apply to. Um, so I would say the kind of 
I don't know, I, I would recommend doing research. Uh, so looking at all the programs online that look interesting, thinking about where you wanna live, um, I think is important. Uh, and like a totally valid reason to like include, you know, do you want to live in a city? Do you want to get a different type of experience? Um, do you want to be in a place where there are a lot of marshals, like uh, usually in kind of the Oxford, Cambridge, London area? Or do you want to be in a place that might be a little bit more off of the marshal path as well? Um, and then I would reach out to current students in the program or marshals that have been there uh, because the both, I think, for like a research program and the master's, the experience you'll have is going to differ a ton based on the program. So some of them, you might have big lecture classes and very little contact with um, kind of lectures and just like a big test at the end. Um, there are some programs that are a little bit less academically rigorous. And I think some people uh, come and it's a little bit you know, less intense than what they're used to, which can be great because you have a, you know, a lot of time to get involved in other things. So maybe that's perfect for you. Um, or you maybe are going to want a little bit more. Um, smaller programs, you might have a lot more contact both with your kind of cohort uh, and with the lectures. Uh, so I think the best way to get insight into this is to try and reach out to people, um, kind of the professors, whoever is running the course. Uh, I've had people ask me on LinkedIn about my master's degree. So I think it's like totally valid to just try and find people and write them and see if you can get into contact with them. And definitely use former like current or former marshals as well as a resource for that. Um, and then just to add, there was one question also talking about switching areas. Uh, and I think that's really common within the marshal. So the main thing that I would say is just like, think about like what your story is. Uh, and, and I think that's sort of what you need to do is what do you wanna do? What do you wanna get out of it? And how do you sort of pitch like what you've done in the past um, as like, this is why you want to re to study this in the UK or, or why like maybe your background isn't exactly the same thing that you're proposing to do, um, but you still are probably prepared to take that on uh, while you're in the UK. So I definitely sort of switched programs and like, you know, I'd taken some humanities classes because generally the US education system is a lot more interdisciplinary, um, but I was not a social scientist by any means. Uh, and did that in my master's and in my first degree. Um, and so I think it's it's very well accepted and embraced. So I would say go for it if you want to try something different. We've had um, a few more questions from the audience. And just because we're coming close to the end, I, there's one specific one that I think is very helpful. If uh, the panelists who are know more about this could expand upon the difference between research and taught master programs. They specifically asked for taught degrees. Should applicants still have identified potential mentors within the departments they're applying for? I can I can take this one since I'm doing a research degree than a taught degree. So I, I think I'm well, well posed to the answer to this question. Um, so I the answer to that is it would help. Um, so whenever I, this is kind of bouncing off of Jim's point about um, making a connection with a professor before you apply. I feel like that's very important and you don't necessarily have to have a connection. Um, you can just cold email professors. Like that's what I did. I just cold emailed them and told them about myself a little bit and introduced myself. And then I started making like forging that relationship over the months leading up to the application so that I could write that in the application. I could talk about that relationship during the interview and they could also help me prepare the application. They helped me prep for the interview because they wanted me to come and do their programs. And that was true for both the research program where I had to just, um, I identified a research mentor that I wanted to work with we thought up a, a good collaboration experiment actually, or collaboration project, actually collaborating with my undergrad institution, um, which is really, really cool. And um, I kind of played to that, used that um, whenever I was applying to kind of show that I'm bridging the two institutions, kind of bridging the two nations, sort of like the ambassadorial potential thing. Um, but also for the taught degree, I did reach out to the program heads, the directors and the creators of the master's program in, at KCL, uh, King's College London. Uh, and at the beginning, it was just to make sure that um, what they were offering was exactly what I wanted and whether or not I would be a good fit um, and really find, like they would send me the, um, not just the syllabi, but like all the course content and I could like read through it and see, because I've heard a couple stories of some of my um, friends and then past marshals who sign up for a, one degree um, and it's not exactly what they thought it would be um, because reading a website description versus actually sitting in on the class and learning the content, there can be a disconnect. Um, so I would definitely um, recommend, even if you're doing a taught degree, if you're doing a research degree, and the thing about the UK is it's not uh, a binary thing. It's not just taught or research. There's also like split degrees where you can do like 50% research, 50% taught, or like 75% taught, 25% research. So it really spans the whole gamut. It's really a spectrum. Um, and you can really find a, a good program that'll fit your um, niche. But for me, 
uh, I wanted to design a, a kind of Marshall program for myself where I got one year of research where I could just focus um, in the lab and then one year in the classroom where I could just focus in the classroom. And I thought that would, um, both these degrees uh, ultimately are going to help me reach my career goal. And that's how I kind of spun it. Um, but I think specific fit, the specificity, especially because I think Hope was saying that the degrees in the UK can get very, very specific. And you can usually use that to your advantage because if you have a very specific interest, you should apply for a very specific degree. And then whenever you're applying for the Marshall, you can make a really, really good case for it. Because like, for example, my degree at KCL, there's really no other degree like it in the world. In my, like, it, it, it just doesn't exist because it's very, very specific. Um, and it's very specific to what matches my interest. So I think that's something that you should really take into consideration when you're looking for a program, whether or not it's a great fit for you. Like you should fit the program and the program should fit you. It's a, it's a two-way street. Great, and you touched upon this and this was gonna be my last audience question before I end the floor and let you guys have your final words. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts about the ambassadorship component of the Marshall Scholarship, anything you would suggest them to know or with your own experience, Erin, you touched on, upon it very quickly and very great with how you approached it, but anyone else have thoughts? It didn't um, exist in my day, so no comment. <clears throat> oh, I, <laughs> I was just going to say that I think that this is a lot about leadership and kind of just connecting with other communities, how you've done that. I think that there are a lot of like, I wouldn't, I mean, I, this question is kind of seems I framed around science and medicine as if like this is an area where there aren't as many opportunities for ambassadorial potential, but I don't think that's at all the case. I mean, we heard, hope, I think your comments at the outset about how you like led the marshal led you to explore you know a postdoc in germany like you make these connections you learn how science is practiced in different places like that i think that is one aspect of ambassadorial potential right like within the scientific community you could talk about um maybe bringing that back to the u.s you, there are there are sort of it, i don't think ambassadorial potential has to mean a kind of like policy or political science um, engagement, it can, it can mean a lot of different things. I think that's a really important thing to add in here. Emily, do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, I agree that um, it really doesn't have to be totally about policy and it really can just be about doing great science and great collaborative science. Um, and if doing um, collaborations between a U.S. institution and a U.K. institution is something you're really interested in. Um, you can also look into the NIH Oxford Cambridge Scholars Program, which I am also a part of. Um, and that program actually means that I'll only do two years of my PhD research here at Oxford, and then I'll do another two years back in the U.S. Um, with my joint lab at the National Cancer Institute. And they are more so experts in uh, brain cancer, um, but not so much in cancer vaccines. And so my project would not exist without both labs and managing a transatlantic um, collaboration for a PhD project is no small feat, but it's also um, a really great learning experience. And I think research is only getting more and more international. Um, if you're interested in medicine, clinical trials are only more and more international and they're stronger because of that. Um, and so having experience with researchers or professors or even physicians um, in both the US and the UK can really give you some strong perspectives um, when you are the people uh, kind of at the head of, of really uh, forging those collaborations. Well, thank you so much for that response. We are at a little over 115, so I think I'm gonna end it here. I wanna start off by thanking all of you so much for joining us here today. I know I learned a lot from hearing from each of your different perspectives and I really do hope that those who attended learned a lot about it. Um, we do have some more sessions today and tomorrow, so I just sent them in the chat. If you wanna register for any of those sessions, feel free. Um, you're gonna be able to hear from some more great alumni in different academic areas, but also different aspects of the Marshall Scholarship process in general, which I think is very informative. 
Um, if you would like to apply for the Marshall Scholarship, please contact your academic institution's fellowship advisor and hopefully they can help you get started on the application process. Um, if anyone of our panels have any last words they want to add, feel free. Otherwise, we can sign off shortly. If you have any further questions, I guess I think this is often the case, but I can't speak for everybody, but feel free to email any of us or me at least. I'm happy to talk more. Yeah, feel free if you if you feel comfortable with proposing that information. If you want to say your email or put it in the chat, feel free. I just don't want to be the one to share it in case you don't want that yeah, out there. Fine, but thank you so much. Yeah, plus one to that. I, I spoke to a lot of uh, like former and current scholars when I was doing the application process and it helped a ton. So definitely don't be shy to reach out. Just do a bunch of cold emails. Always works. Thank you and in all regards so to cold much. emails, don't be discouraged if professors here don't email you back or they just say like, no, I got so much of that. It was really disheartening in the application process because I think applications are really emotionally difficult, like in general, um, but don't be too discouraged by that. And yeah, I would totally second that. Reach out to um, past marshals from your university or other people and um, people are really happy to talk. There's a lot of weird intricacies to everything. And I think it's always good to know more uh, going into these things. Great, and thank you all so much for being so open and ready to talk to potential applicants as well about their process and their, your experience. So thank you so much. On that note, I will let everyone have a break before the next session at 1.30. Thank you all so much for your time and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>